Welcome to my Rayman 3 Fan Remake Devlog series. I invite you to join me as I talk about my journey of learning Unreal Engine and programming. I will go over how I made this blank scene turn into this. Come on, I'm kidding. Hey, I like that outfit on you. When does it come off? I'll be showing the models I've made, C++ code, and blueprint code. All right, let's dive in. So in today's episode, I would like to put Glowbox in a barrel. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what I gotta do here. So when I run up to the barrel, it seems to run away not too far. Of course, it starts running the other way. If I run from the back, it jumps above the gaps and the door blocks it. And that's pretty much it. So I kind of had two different ideas of how to approach this. One of them was going the AI route. So making this barrel some kind of AI controlled character. And the other one was to make a predetermined path using a curve and just have the barrel follow the path when Raymond gets too close. I decided to go for the second option because for one, I'd have to learn how to make AI and that kind of seems like a big endeavor just for this little barrel that just runs away from Rayman. So the second reason is that I was afraid that making an AI wouldn't be as foolproof as just having it use kind of simple math to run away from Rayman. Okay, I made that sound like there's a third reason, but it's just these two reasons actually. <laughs> okay, but as per usual, let's start with making a 3D model. I made a dedicated texture for the plum drawing. In Blender, I made a skeleton for the barrel that uses one bone. This is the animation when it's standing still and being terrified. This is the run animation and also a jumping animation. It looks a little weird because I just want the animation to rotate the barrel and not actually lift it up because I'm going to make the jump in the path itself for the barrel. By the way, this low risk model is not some kind of retopology I've done. It's just a proxy model, so Blender doesn't lag when playing these animations. In Unreal, I'm still using Nanite for this, even though it's parented to a skeleton. I'm allowed to do this because I'm not exporting this as a skeletal mesh. I'm just parenting the static mesh to this bone. I do this for all the models that don't need deformation, like the turtle shell. To do this, in the blueprint, you just take the static mesh and make it a child of the skeletal mesh and then you can attach it to whatever bone you need to over here. Now, before we go into making the barrel's logic, let's quickly deal with making this button close the door. All right, so here I am at the door's blueprint. The boulder is a separate mesh, and at this moment is at negative 370. If it's at zero, then it's blocking. So in the event graph, I made this custom block event that when it's called, I use a timeline that lasts for 0.8 seconds. So that's how long the door is going to be closing. And during this timeline, the door is lurping from that hidden position to the blocking position by feeding this value to the set relative location node. I keep it closed for nine seconds. Although this is something that I could make a variable to be controlled in the blueprint. I just didn't see a reason to do that because this is the only door like this in the whole game. Anyway, so after nine seconds, I have another timeline that reverses the effect of the first timeline. So we lerp from the blocking location back to the hidden location. And that's it for the door. Now for the button. Here's the model. I also added the box collider for Rayman to overlap with. And once Rayman overlaps with this collider, I set this collider's position somewhere below the button so Rayman can't collide with it again. Although now that I think about it, it'd probably be safer and simpler to just disable the collision. And then I call the block event on the Glowbox barrel blocker. So this one over here that I was discussing a moment ago. In order to connect this button to that door, I make the Glowbox barrel blocker a public variable on the button. And then in the scene, 
if I choose this button, I have Glowbox Barrel Blocker as a variable that I can set in the editor. And then I just set the one from the scene that I want to control. I have only one, so there's only one to choose from. So now the button knows that I want to call this specific doors block event. And then what's left is the kind of graphical side of things. So making this button move smoothly down and then back up again. And I did this pretty much the same way as I did the door movement. So using a timeline and lerping between two positions. Then after a delay, I revert it. As well as reverting the box collision back to its starting position. This one doesn't need a lerp though. Although one, one issue I see here right now is I reset the box collision's location before the button gets to reset its position, which is a minor bug, but, but the fix is just too easy to ignore. All I really need to do is reset the box collision's location after the button animation finishes playing. All right, let's get back to the barrel. Okay, so here I made a track for Glowbox. It's a loop with these jumps over here. And then there are these boxes over here on his track also. And what I make them do is whenever the barrel overlaps with them and Rayman is no longer in range, that's when he stops. So instead of making the barrel stop whenever Rayman is not in range, I kind of make him run to, towards some kind of set point because otherwise I run the risk that Globox stops in midair and this way I have some kind of control over where his stopping points are. Okay, so here we are in the barrel blueprint now. This large sphere collision over here is for the barrel to know that Rayman is too close and it's time to start running. So once Rayman overlaps with this collision, that's when the running starts. Okay, let's take a look at the event graph. Okay, so here's the logic for moving along this spline and it starts kind of over here with this branch. So in the branch, we feed in whether Rayman has overlapped with that large sphere collision. And if that is true, first what we have to do is decide which way the barrel has to start running. So if Rayman's coming from the front or from the back, I put the nodes for that in this macro over here to have a little less nodes on the screen. So it's just easier for me to read. Anyway, if we go into this macro, what it does, it checks the dot product between the vector created by subtracting the player's location from the barrel's location and the barrel's forward vector. And now by just checking whether the dot product is larger than zero or not, I know whether Rayman is behind the barrel or not. Anyway, once we know if Rayman is behind the barrel or in front, then I set the direction to one or minus one. And now using the direction and the barrel speed variable, I can set the current speed and increase or decrease the distance along the spline using my current speed. If you're wondering where this cable is traveling to, it's going to the delta seconds so the barrel movement is frame independent. Okay, so I'm getting the distance along the spline and I'm setting the barrel's location. Basically, it's the same logic that we had when making the butterflies move along the spline, except here the direction sometimes changes. And to set this actor's location, I enable the sweep because I want the barrel to detect whenever it hits the barrel blocker, you know, the door we were talking about before. This is kind of where we have to move a little bit back. And maybe I'll move these cables a little bit so it's easier to see what's going on. I feed this sweep hit result into a branch. So whenever the barrel hits something, all this movement stuff doesn't happen. So it stops. I also have this branch over here that takes in the sweep hit result to set the current speed to zero. So actually this is what makes it stop and then this branch over here is what make it not unstop. <laughs> However, I I think that this is a little dumb. And instead of doing this over here, I could just set the current speed here in this branch. Let me check if this is working. Yeah, the barrel stops. Okay, anyway. I also set the barrel's rotation so it always faces the direction it's going, the same way as it was for the butterflies. And once again, just like with the butterflies, I need these nodes over here to set the distance back to zero once distance is larger than the spline length. So 
the barrel loops around the spline. So that's the barrel's movement along the spline working. But now I need some kind of way for the barrel to know when it's jumping so it plays the jump animation. As you can see when it's never jumping it's not shaking or walking. I hope you can see what's happening. And here's how I figured it out. Can you see these points on the spline over here? The way I laid them out isn't really random, it's pretty specific. So these points have all have numbers. Like this one is one, this one would be two, this one would be number three and four and so on. So now what I do is I find that they're called, those points are called input keys by the way. And I find the closest input key to the barrel's location. So let me kind of visualize this for you. On the left over here, I'm printing the current closest input key. And as you can see, this is a float value. So while the barrel's on the ground, the closest input key is always some kind of even number with some kind of remainder. So like 2.4. And when the barrel's in the air, it's an odd number with some kind of remainder, like 3.5. So going back to our blueprint, we can see that what I do is I divide the closest input key by two and check if the remainder is larger or equal than one. Because if the barrel's on the ground and we have this even number with a remainder, like the 2.4, then the remainder will be just 0.4, so less than one. And that means that the barrel is not jumping currently. However, if the barrel's in the air, so we have this 3.5 that we took, for example, then the remainder of this division will be 1.5, so more than one. Therefore, we can tell the animation blueprint that the barrel should be jumping right now. And this is what we do. Depending on this check of jumping, we set jumping to true or false. Of course, using a branch here is kind of redundant. You can delete this and just plug it this right over here. Yeah, sorry. If I'm remembering correctly, all these barrel related blueprints were among the first blueprints I created for this project, so very early on in my learning process. And in the animation state machine for the barrel, I use the is jumping variable for the transition from idle or walking. Also, while we're in the animation blueprint, I'll just add that to check if the barrel should be in the idle or walking animation, I just check its current speed. I plug in this absolute node because when Rayman causes the barrel to run the other direction, the speed value is in the negatives. Okay, but this is also needlessly complex. I could just use a not equal. Boom. And lastly, there are the boxes that are supposed to stop the barrel. Those simply just set the barrel's speed to zero whenever the barrel overlaps them. For the barrel's damage response, there's no real reason to do this this video because when the barrel gets destroyed, it should spawn a cutscene and glow box, which at this point in time, I didn't have yet. So I'll just leave this for a future devlog episode where I go over the cutscenes. Now the last thing to cover about this exterior part of the level before I start talking about the inside of the fairy council in the next devlog episode are these health orbs. So let's start with the particle system. It has a lot of layers because every one of those spinning circles is two layers, one for the circle and one for the trail. And also the middle is made out of two layers. One is this kind of erratic core, maybe let's call it. And the other one is this kind of afterglow. The material for the core looks something like this, a high contrast cloud texture. And I offset the UVs with a crystal texture that's animated using a panner. The cloud noise is animated as well. And then I use a sphere mask for the opacity. So the shape is a circle. The rest of the pieces use pretty standard materials. I made a custom one for the ribbon, but it's very simple. It's just this trail made by combining two simple gradient textures. Those trails rotating around the middle are just using the rotate around point node. However, the middle part is animated using scale sprite size and I scale it using a waveform, the compounds sine cosine waveform. Every one of them give cool different effects, but I somehow just like this one the most. Same for the glow. Along with this particle system, I made a particle system 
for when Rayman collects a health orb. So it kind of implodes and dies out. And then another particle system that spawns at Rayman's location when he picks up the health orb. I kind of wanted this to look as if the health orb essence was kind of going into Rayman. So if my health isn't full, once I pick him up, this happens. And just like in the original game, once my health is actually full, then they just kind of hop and ignore me. Okay, so let's check out the blueprint. So they're made of a collision, the particle system, and a point light. And once Rayman overlaps with them, we get Rayman's current health and check if it's equal to his max health. Let's say they are equal, then I use a timeline to make the health orb jump up and down. So pretty much the same as how I made the door close before. However, if Rayman's health isn't full, I add the health orb's health variable to Rayman's health and set his new current health. Spawn in that health orb death particle. I also have a heal event on the player that gets called. All this event does is play the healing sound and spawn that other particle system that I was showing attached to Rayman's location. So basically it just handles the visual side of things. And then I destroy the health orb. There's one other small thing I did with the health orbs. If you look closely, the light underneath the health orb kind of flickers. It might be a little hard to notice. I wanted it to feel like this flickering of the core changes the light intensity. So to do this, in event tick, I oscillate the light's intensity using a sine function. So I get the game time in seconds and multiply them by 10, so the flickering is a little faster. I also plug in an absolute node because I don't want the sine function values to be negative. And then I remap the sine function values to be from 0.66 to 1 instead of 0 to 1. That's because otherwise the light would be vanishing completely whenever the sine function would be at 0. And that just wouldn't look correct because it's not like the health orbs are disappearing when they are pulsating. Alright, that's it for today's episode. In the next one, like I said, we'll actually go inside the Fairy Council Tower. I hope you had a good time watching and I wish you all a great day.